Hi, this is Mark Palmquist. Um, I'm going to do one more video. Uh, the last video was fluid dynamics um, through the lens of uh, conservation of momentum. And this time uh, I'm going to expand on that a little bit and, and um, point out some things that apply to boats, uh, either uh, multi-hulls or, or monohulls. And um, also I'm going to discuss um, uh, concave rocker lines. Okay, so what you saw in the experiment was um, I took a shape that that basically had a, a, this type of profile, stuck it in a stream of water, and initially it did move this direction, but then it stopped moving as soon as the water um, exited. So once, so it, it started accelerating when the when the water started going this direction. So as the water was accelerating to the left, um, the object moved to the right, and then it, the water straightened out over here, and then the object stopped pulling this direction. Um, so that was really interesting. So so a hull that is shaped like this, I've, I've begun to see uh, hulls that sort of have this uh, concave front and co concave back. Most of them have the concave mostly only in the back, but some of them have it also in the front. I was trying to understand why, and uh, so um, so if the water hits here and then it's deflected this way, but it's brought back and then it exited, it's in this direction. Um, there's no net uh, rotation. Uh, and the the suction in this direction is, is almost nothing. So uh, that's very interesting. So if a hull like this um, comes out of the water and then the water lines here, then then it would start sucking again because the water would be going up this direction. Um, but, um, okay, so let's go back to the Hobie 16 asymmetric hull. Um, so the top view of the hull kind of looks like this. Um, all the curvature is on the inside. Here, I'll draw, draw the other one. Um, and then you got rudders here. And the rudders kind of kill all of the uh, the effect of this this uh, curved surface. But let's say so. Imagine that instead of that, the Hobie was shaped more like this. And let's say it had an asymmetrical um, lifting foil here with the curvature on the inside. So if the water hit that, then the water would come off in this direction. So in this case, because it's um, in the middle of the boat, uh, it actually does help direct the boat um, from slipping downwind because, you know, the boat wants to kind of go downwind this way. But if there's a force um, coming off the back in this direction of water, then uh, it would actually help the boat from going downwind. And in this case, because it's going through the center of mass of the hull, um, it would not cause any turning of the hull. So um, a lifting foil that's vertical or slightly angled that's in the middle of a hull on a catamaran or even a trimaran is actually helpful um, because it, it does actually counter um, the boat slipping downwind. And because a foil is um, high aspect ratio. Uh, it's very efficient at doing its job. Um, a long hull is not very good at um, causing uh, the boat to, to go up upwind. Okay, so now let's go back to rocker. Here's a boat. Let's say this is a um, uh, 
Here's the water. Um, okay, so how would a boat like this handle? So uh, a boat like this with an arc shaped rocker, it, it, it's, it's good for, for monohulls that are going slow. Uh, because you can, it has more volume, and uh, so you can get more weight in there. Um, it's not the best for, uh, let, let's say you want a, a, a boat that can hydroplane. And the reason for that is um, it, it has to do with the angle in the back. Um, you would have to pitch, you would have to move all your weight, and you'd have to go way over here, um, and uh, to be able to pitch, the the front of the boat up to get the uh this so then you would have the water shooting out in that direction um so a boat with excessive rocker uh it, it, it's harder to to have them hydroplane so uh these days um i've i've seen a lot of boats that almost have no rocker at all and then i look at the the speed that this boat goes like the reverso um, the reverso, it has a plumb bow and the bottom is almost completely flat. And if you look at the top, it's kind of like shaped like this. It's, it's just kind of like a regular shape of a boat. Um, but if you look at the, I, I it, it appears like the, uh, the depth of curvature is only like 3.5 inches on this boat and it's like you know 14 foot long or something and this boat um, goes uh, 16 knots I was shocked to hear that it went 16 knots but now that I think of it um, the reason it can, can go that fast is because it almost has no rocker at all and if you put the weight back here um, the front of the boat will rise up and then you'll, you'll basically be hydroplaning. Um, so that was very interesting. Of course, uh, everything is a trade-off, so uh, this boat would not be very fast in really low wind conditions, um, especially if the, the, uh, the stern is underwater. If the stern is underwater, um, then you have drag, you have swirling action. Okay, so I've been thinking a lot about this, and um, I've been thinking about the, uh, the, the, the deflection of this water, and then, then how it continues to go down for a while, and then it, ha it basically bounces back, and eventually it bounces back and it comes above the nominal water line, and then it goes back down, so you get a, a wave here. And I was thinking, you know, um, the lift created by this, is about the same as like let's say this was a, a boat a boat haul and um, it, it kind of creates the same amount of lift as a boat that is much longer almost twice as long basically um, but the surface area of contact is very sh much smaller it's only from you know here to there so that's that's one of the advantages that's why hydroplaning is so efficient it has to do with uh, you're, you're basically cutting the, the, the back half of the boat off uh, and, and you're, you're just shortening the water, um, the wetted surface area. And in this case, you know, people talk about um, uh, length water line as a formula for the speed of a boat, but in this case, it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, Okay, so let's say that this, this hydroplaning surface um, doubles in speed, and um, let's see what happens then. Uh, let's see here, I think I have some space here. So let's see what this wedge does when it's going twice as fast. What happens is when you go twice as fast, the water, uh, the wedge lifts out of the water, and now the contact point is here, and now it goes further before it rebounds, because um, 
It has to do with the hardness of the water. Um, water actually gets harder as it gets, as you uh, move faster through it. And, uh, you know, it, it's like, that's why you can, if you walk into a swimming pool, you, you almost experience no resistance. But if you fall into a swimming pool, um, especially from like 10 meters, uh, there will be uh, resistance. It'll feel harder. So that's what I mean by the water at, at higher speed. And, and that's what the Reynolds number is all about. It has to do with the hardness of the water. Uh, well, that's not the only thing it has to do with, but that's one of the things it has to do with. So, um, so the water hits here and is deflected. And then because it, the water is harder, it, its radius of rebound is longer. So now it does this and then it goes up like this and back down. So there's a wave back here. Um, so in this case, the wetted surface area is from there to there, but the lift that you get is, is equal to a hull that's like this long. So um, all this water is displaced, but it's displaced by the force created by this wedge from here to here. So that's another way of looking at it. And that kind of explains why uh, hydroplaning uh, is very efficient at generating lift because you get more lift with less um, with less wetted area as the speed increases.